Mark was a uh, dual major, University of Rochester, Neuroscience and Interdisciplinary Studies, focusing on geriatric health. He got his MD from SUNY uh, Syracuse, and then was a resident in neurology and chief resident at uh, Boston University before moving to uh, University of Pennsylvania as a faculty member in the department of neurology. Mark's lab and Mark uh, was one of the first researchers to really identify the usefulness of functional imaging uh, to understand and uh, cognitive processes. And some of the work that he and his lab did in the 90s on uh, analysis techniques and data collection techniques are still in use today. Uh, in 2000, uh, Mark moved to uh, Berkeley, where he's now the, he's been the professor of professor in psychology, neuroscience, and the director of the Henry uh, Wheeler Brain Imaging Center. He's also a resident uh, neurologist at the Martinez VA, and chief of uh, Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience, and on editorial boards of a number of uh, other important journals in cognitive neuroscience. The number of publications, grants, and awards that Mark has received over his career are really too many for us to mention here. Uh, but I would like to mention one aspect of Mark's career that is uh, particularly important uh, to me. Uh, Mark has really been one of the best PIs to train the next generation of cognitive neuroscientists. He has consistently funded and mentored as many as 10 or more postdocs throughout his lab uh, since the, uh, the beginning of the century. And uh, he provides them with resources graduate students as well, resources to do good science, and the training and mentoring to learn how to do that. And that's particularly surprising given his um, administrative and uh, other roles. Um, and just as evidence of that, uh, members of his lab have gone on to tenure track faculty uh, positions. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, Brown, Illinois, McGill, Michigan, NYU, North Carolina, Penn, Stanford, Texas, Toronto, UCLA, Wisconsin, many others as well, including uh, four of us who came through Mark's lab in different ways, uh, who are now uh, faculty here at Georgia Tech. So uh, I think that that's one of Mark's greatest legacies, and I'm happy to introduce him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me in the back okay? Is it fine? Is it good? Great. Um, really appreciate being invited. It, it's, it's great to always to go someplace where I know people uh, that's been through the lab. I've, I've been to the Atlanta airport many times and never have been able to visit, so it's great to actually be on campus. Uh, it's also great to experience other kinds of weather. Uh, we don't get this kind of hot and humid weather, as you know, in the Bay Area, so, it's, uh, so now I know what it's like. We're going to try and get rid of this and move towards that. So I'm going to, you know, over, as you heard, you've been doing this for a while, and, and I'd say over the past 25 years, I've really been zooming, at least our lab, has really been zooming in on the prefrontal cortex, the dopaminergic system, you know, cognitive abilities like working memory, executive function. Uh, and, you know, over the last few years, I've been starting to, you know, as I'm getting older, moving towards what they call the sunset uh, years, I'm starting to zoom out. And my talk today really is about sort of trying to consider all of these different systems in the context of the large scale organization of the brain. And so my talks are getting uh, more broader uh, and my titles are getting much shorter. So today I'm just calling it the modular uh, brain. And I'm happy to take questions as we go along if you want. If I don't see it, just sort of shout out. <clears throat> and the question I wanna ask today uh, is the brain a modular system? So let me first define what I mean by modularity since it means many things to many people. It is a, modules are a set of independent and self-contained units that can be used to construct a more complex system. Uh, each of these, mo each module is comprised of a number of nodes uh, for the brain, that'll be particular brain regions that are densely intraconnected uh, to each other, but sparsely interconnected to uh, nodes and other modules. Modules implement discrete functions, and the functioning of each module does not interact 
is there two knots there, does not interact uh, with other modules, except when that module has completed its processing, and then it can uh, make that end product available to the other modules. So I think most of us believe that the brain is a modular system. I mean, but if you look at the direct, direct evidence of, for each of these components of modularity, it's actually not as strong as, as you would think. And modularity is clearly ubiquitous, ubiquitous across many different types of systems, uh, s types of networks. Social networks such as Facebook, or man-made networks such as air flight patterns, or biological systems such as protein interactions and gene regulation. So one of the ways to sort of study the mod modular, modularity of the brain is to turn the brain into a graph. And a graph as, is just a mathematical object as I'm depicting here. Whereas the nodes of the graft will be brain regions and the edges will be the connections between those regions. And so in a graphical model of brain network, um, we can examine the properties of nodes and edges and how they influence, uh, and how they influence the overall large scale organization. <clears throat> and to turn the brain into a graph, uh, there are several, several different types of brain data that we can use. We can use anatomical, structural MRI data and parcelate the brain into its pieces um, based on the structure and turn that into a set of nodes and edges. We can use physiology data, such as functional MRI data, which I'll mostly be talking about today, or, or physiology data such as uh, MEG or EEG data, and turn each of, the, uh, er each of the areas in which we get a series of, of, of data points into a set of uh, nodes and edges. And a comprehensive map of all of these connections in the brain has been referred to as the connectome. And this was a word uh, coined independently by Olaf Sporns and Patrick Hagerman back in 2005. And Olaf had told me that if you Googled connect, when he thought about it, he Googled connectome at that time. And the only thing he could find was something called connect to me, which was a, <coughs> which was a dating service. <coughs> now last night, I'm sorry, I'm kind of getting over a cold. Last night when I Googled uh, connectome, I got 400,000 hits. So, as best as I can tell, the only thing that's rising as fast as sort of more rapidly than using Connectome is Starbucks uh, being opened up around the world. So Connectome is, is upon us. It's like a tidal wave, and it's, it, it's, it's, it's taking over the neuroscience world, at least in imaging. But, all, but again, I'm just referring to the, a sort of a comprehensive map of, of the brain. And so I want to talk today about sort of using bold fMRI data to create a brain graph and to sort of look at the, connect, the overall connectivity of the brain. And what most of the data I'm going to present is actually data collected at rest. It really only requires about five or ten minutes of collecting bold data with the subject not performing any task and looking at the signal across time and, and the fluctuations of that signal across time. What was discovered by Biswal back quite a long time ago that if you look at the bold signal in areas such as primary motor cortex, it has these slow, there's these slow, uh, low, spontaneous, low frequency fluctuations that seem to be physiologically meaningful. Because if you look for other areas that also have similar fluctuations in time that are correlated with the signal in motor cortex, you find that it's other areas of the same system, presumably of, of, the, of the same connected system, either anatomically or Functionally, so motor you find motor cortex, premotor cortex, supplementary motor area, basal ganglia, cerebellum, all areas known to be anatomically connected. Suggesting that we can identify sort of networks, intrinsic networks, with this very simple technique of examining data, uh, bold data collected at rest. Now, this study by Vincent and Mark Reichel and colleagues at WashU in monkeys. Uh, really established that these correlated powers of activity were not spiritual, they weren't emanating from the heavens, uh, they weren't something that wasn't from the brain, but rather reflected something, rather reflected real anatomical or functional brain networks. <coughs> what they did was collect resting bold fMRI data from monkeys while they were anesthetized. And when the spirits and the heavens should go away, and what they find is if you look at they looked at several networks, but in this case, they looked at an ocular motor network. You find correlated activity <coughs> between frontal eye fields and parietal cortex, known areas of anatomical connectivity that were identical to the areas that you would find if you looked at evoked activity from their moving their eyes, or if you actually labeled 
those cells and looked at uh, retrograde tracer injections of areas of, of uh, parietal and frontal eye fields. So in this way, in a very simple fashion, one can identify this network, oculomotor network in this, in this example, in a simple way that reflected a real uh, anatomical network. Now, this has been done over and over again with in healthy young volunteers uh, and across labs, across countries, across scanners, uh, you find typically that there are consistently eight or 10 or 12 different networks or what I'm gonna call modules can be identified in this way. And here's an example of uh, eight such networks uh, shown in red. These are anything shown in this orange color is areas that are showing these correlated activity and presumably of a, of, of a or one network where regions are more connected with each other than with other regions. Now I'm gonna begin by testing the idea of modularity by focusing on these bottom two networks here. These are two networks that have been <coughs> identified and talked about quite a bit in the cognitive literature, and I'll get back to it later, uh, by Nico Dosenbach and colleagues at Washington University. Uh, one is called, he's labeled a single opercular network because it involves nodes from the anterior prefrontal cortex, cingulate, and insular regions versus a frontal parietal network, which is uh, uh, mostly nodes from lateral, frontal, and brow regions. And what's characteristic of all of these networks that are identified in this manner <coughs> is that they exhibit significant within module connectivity, if you look at correlated patterns of the bold response, but negative between modular connectivity, meaning that all these nodes are, are strongly correlated with each other, but the connectivity of this module as a whole is negatively correlated with the connectivity of this module, which provides kind of indirect evidence that this, these modules are functioning autonomously. What we had reasoned was that if these modules actually function independently or autonomous, autonomously, that damage to one of these networks should not affect the connectivity in the other network. So damage to here would not affect connectivity in the frontal parietal network or damage to a node within the frontal parietal network would not affect connectivity uh, with the, uh, the other one. And this would provide direct evidence that these, these uh, modules are functioning autonomously. Now the way we did this was to recruit patients from my neurology clinic that had focal lesions from a stroke. So this is 21 patients that we recruited to Berkeley to be scanned and we collected resting fMRI data to, to, to identify these networks. Each of these patients has had a stroke <coughs> approximately at least six, uh, long, six months or farther back and they, in red here, is the uh, site of where their, their lesion was. And so we had different patients with different lesions all throughout the cortex. This is just sort of a composite map of all of those patients, just to see that we had sort of lesions distributed throughout the, throughout the cerebral cortex. We didn't cover all areas, but we co covered many areas of the frontal parietal temporal lobes. And here I'm just sort of showing uh, for each patient, we have da each of those patients have damage to particular nodes in each of those networks. So these are the nodes, brain regions of the single opercular network, these are the nodes in the frontal parietal network, and each one of these patients will have damage to different, air, different regions within each of those networks. <clears throat> so in this way, we, could, we can assign a metric for each patient of the extent of either damage to the frontal parietal uh, network or the, the, the single opercular network. So this patient out here would, would, be, would have mostly single opercular damage. This patient here would have mostly frontal parietal damage. And the idea would be, the prediction is that those patients that have damage to the frontal parietal network would not have any changes in their connectivity in their CO network and vice versa. And that would be a direct test that we have got modules in the brain that are, that are functioning autonomously. This was work done by Amy Nomura, who was a postdoc in my lab, and Katarina Gratton, who was a graduate student and now a postdoc at WashU. And what they showed here is how they present the results here is on this axis here is the extent of their damage. So each one of these dots is a different patient. 
On here is, is damage going from high frontal parietal damage to, to high signal percolar damage. And here is the, the strength of the connectivity in the signal percolar network versus the frontal parietal network. And what you see is this negative correlation, meaning that if you have uh, patients with high frontal parietal damage uh, have reduced connectivity within that module, but connectivity within the other module is intact. You flip to the other side, patient with, with, with a lot of damage to the single percolar network has, uh, still has uh, normal connectivity within the other network, suggesting they are, they are, they are not, um, they are functioning independently. The damage to one is not significantly affecting the function of the other one. So, in a way, at least I feel this sort of provides direct evidence that there are modules that can function autonomously, at least I the way we identified in this way. But if these modules do function autonomously, the next question really is, is whether or not they're implementing discrete functions. And that's sort of a much tougher question to get at. Um, so far, the approach that, that most cognitive neuroscientists has used to assign functions to each of these modules has been how they, how they are engaged by certain tasks. If this module is always engaged with some certain type of task, we might label it sort of an attention module or, or maybe give it a fancier name. Uh, so for example, Dosenbach uh, and colleagues looked at how these modules are engaged by 10 different tasks in over 183 subjects, and they postulated that the frontal parietal network is a network that's providing signals that act on sort of a rapid time scale to adjust control, whereas the single percular network uh, is, a, is, a, is a system that is allowing for sort of a, uh, is a system that acts on a longer time scale that's kind of allowing for more set maintenance. So they have assigned sort of a process based on tasks to a, to a network. And to me, this approach is kind of unsatisfying because it, it's, it's kind of the same approach we've taken for 20 years. We, for many years, we have assigned a fairly arbitrary name of a cognitive process to a brain region, and now we're kind of assigning a fairly arbitrary name of a cognitive process to a network. We've just substituted a, a brain region for a network. So for me, at least, this is not very satisfying. But there, you know, obviously this is not a simple problem. There are many reasons why it's very difficult to achieve the goal of mapping a function to a network. Uh, the biggest problem is that we don't have a cognitive ontology. We don't have a formal description of all cognitive functions. Uh, so how, how do we actually even divide up cognition into some limited set of individual processes in some principal fashion that we can map back onto these, onto these, onto these modules? So Thomas Yao uh, when, uh, published a very nice paper in cerebral cortex, which you should read, that, that tried to um, kind of develop a sort of cognitive ontology based on uh, data, based on brain imaging data. And he used the BrainMap database, which is a, a, which is a database um, out of San Antonio that Peter Fox has put together, which is an extremely valuable source of information uh, in where they, they database the activation profiles, the coordinates of activation for experiments, uh, cognitive fMRI and PET experiments. And so right when we looked at the database, there were over 2,000 experiments with 83 different tasks, over 10,000 different experimental conditions. And in this database, you, you, know, you know the name of the type of experiment, uh, you know the type of task that they did, uh, you know where in the brain those uh, tasks activated, what you don't know is uh, what cognitive processes engage that task. You can make up the names, uh, which everyone does, like I said, or you can try to derive it in some principal fashion, and that's what Thomas did. He tried to use a mathematically model to mathematically model this task-based data in order to derive a set of cognitive components uh, that are engaged by all these tasks to try and explain this relationship between brain and behavior, and he used something called a, a, an author, author topic model because it was originally developed uh, to mine text for topics across authors' words in the books that they wrote. So you've got these authors, uh, you've got all these books that they wrote that have a lot of words in them, and you try to uh, derive the topics from that, that, uh, of these authors and, and words. And so you have a probability that there's a topic uh, written by a certain author, you've got this probability that a word is going to be in a certain topic, and you try to derive 
uh, drive the topics. And with that, you can come up with a set of topics that explains this whole corpus of authors and books and come up with topics such as religion and politics and mathematics and science, which form this sort of ontology uh, for this, this relationship. And so your reasons, you can do the same thing with the brain map database, but now you've got tasks instead of authors and you've got voxels in the brain, activations, uh, instead of the, the words, and you've got a probability that there's a, you know, that a certain cognitive, what I'm gonna call component, is engaged by a task, and a probability that that voxel, you know, part of the brain's gonna be engaged by that component, and you can derive a set of cognitive, uh, I'm sorry, you can derive a set of, of cognitive components that explain all of these, all of this, this brain activation data. Now this is the hard part here, trying to get my, uh, okay, let me stop there. So what this is, what he found was there was, there was 12 components that could explain, 12 cognitive components that could explain all this th these thousands of tasks and thousands of, of imaging experiments. And here is the 12 different components, and here is every task that was available in the database. So for every cognitive component, in this case, this is component three, there would be certain tasks that would engage that, that there, this set of tasks would engage just that component, and it would only, and would have a very specific pattern of brain, brain activity. And, and you, can, you can go look at this on the uh, web. He's got this uh, available. You can go through for each component and see that there's, uh, a, a different relationship between the, the tasks and the brain activation, and, and from it, uh, he's derived these 12 components that have 12 very specific patterns of activity. Now, I'm not gonna name the co co components during this talk. You can name them if you want, and he, he, he tried to name them in the, in the paper, which I think is the only weak part of the paper, but for now, I'm telling you there's 12, uh, there's, there's, there, you can explain all this data with at least, with, with these 12 variables. For us, to sort of get evidence that there's modules are linked to specific and discrete functions, uh, Maxwell Bertolero in my lab, a guy who had this idea that these 12 components have a specific pattern of brain activity, uh, and, we, and we also, and we have, likewise, we have modules that we've identified with the rest of the fMRI data. I said there's always like eight to 12, you know, things. Do they line up? Do, do the sort of, the, the modules that have been identified from this brain data, database overlap with these that we can identify from the rest of the fMRI data, or are they, uh, they don't overlap? If they overlap, they, then we might be onto something that, 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 that there's some evidence that there's, there is, that these modules that are derived from the fMRI data is, are implementing discrete functions. And that's exactly what he's found. So our, you know, amazingly, I'm showing you just five of them here. What I'm showing you here is sort of the, a, a module identified from the resting brain, resting fMRI data, and here's a module identified from one of the cognitive components. And for each cognitive component, we could find a, a, a network identified from the bold data. And if you look at all the brain map tasks and you plot sort of for each task, the number of modules engaged by that task and the number of components engaged by the task is this very strong linear relationship. As you engage more cognitive components, you engage more modules, suggesting that modules, each of these modules do uh, implement a discrete function. Now what that function is, is, is uh, left open, but, um, but nevertheless there's evidence that it fits this principle of modularity. Now in medical school I was taught that there was a language module, and here's the language module. It's Wernicke's area connected with the arcuate fasciculus to Broca's area to motor cortex, and this was clearly supported by all the patients that we saw that had language deficits that were localized to uh, lesions here and not to lesions there. You could damage very focal areas and only areas within that network were causing language problems. So we, 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 we've known for a long time, I, I knew before I knew it, that there, was, that there was modules in the brain. But clearly, right, the language module is connected to other modules. You can talk about what you've seen or what you've heard. Different modules from different, different modules are communicating with, with each other. So when I talk about modularity, 
I'm not talking about it in its strictest sense. I'm not saying that there's no communication between or interaction between modules. Of course, uh, modules are interacting with each other. Um, and so when we think about it, as, so the real question is how is information being exchanged between different modules? All these modules are you know, in one head, right? So they have to be communicating with each other some way. But how, how, how are they, how is the input from one, uh, how, how is one input into, into another, yet stay sort of modular uh, in, in, some, in some sense, but not in the strictest sense. So the, really the next question that I want to ask is how are these modules interacting? And we can further ask, we can ask this question by again sort of looking at our brain graphs and using metrics derived from, a, from math called graph theory. And the first two metrics derived from graph theory that I'm going to talk about is participation coefficient and another metric called within modular degree. So here's our graph. There's, there's three different modules in this example. Uh, and there are nodes. But there are different kind of nodes. There's one kind of node which we're going to call a connector hub. And this is a kind of node that's mostly connected with other modules as opposed to nodes within a module. And then there's these hubs that we're going to call provincial hubs which are mostly have connections to other nodes within its module as opposed to other modules. And we're, character, we're classifying these as either a provincial hub or a connector hub based on these measurements. Participation coefficient is just the proportion of edges linking uh, it to nodes in other modules. So that'll go from 0 to 1. And a, a, a node that has a high participate coefficient is going to be a connector hub. And within modular degree, it's just the proportion of the edges linking it to other nodes within its module. And that's a z-score between minus 1 and 1. And, and that will sort of define, <coughs> uh, define these provincial hubs. And so the prediction would be <coughs> that one way that modules interact is through communication between connector hubs rather than communication through provincial hubs. So in this example, the red here are the, are the uh, connector hubs. The blue are the provincial hubs. <coughs> 0, 1, 2, 3 just means the number of cognitive components engaged. So this is a network that uh, where these are networks where there are more increasing number of cognitive components. And as we get to more demanding cognitive tasks where more cognitive components are engaged, we'd expect there to be increasing activity <coughs> within these connector hubs but not increasing activity within the particular um, provincial hubs within that sort of module. So we can go back to the brain, net, brain map database and we can characterize all of the areas of activation as being hubs or uh, provincial hubs or connector hubs and look at the relationship between nodes, um, the activity in, in provincial hubs versus connector hubs and how that relates to the cognitive, engaging different levels of cognitive components. Yeah. Uh, go back. What zero mean then? Yeah, I should have taken I should have taken that out. I was thinking on the plane. What does zero mean? Yeah, it, it, it should have taken that out. Yeah, it, it, it should say one. It should be one, two, three. Yeah, you can't you can't engage zero components. I guess you could at rest, maybe, but yeah, but but I should have taken that out. You're right. It's really just one, two, or three. But in in our case, there's actually you can go all the way up to twelve. So I so the, that was just a cartoon to sort of illustrate that what we want to look at is as we increase from 2 to 12, <coughs> is there any change in hub activity? And what you see here is there's no relationship in all the brain map data, in all the brain map tasks, 83 of them, as you engage more components, <coughs> you don't change hub activity. And you don't actually, and you don't change the number of modules that are engaged. But if you look at the connector nodes, there's this significant relationship that as you engage more components, there is more engagement and activity specifically within these connector nodes. And you also engage more modules, suggesting that the communication between these modules is being mediated through these connector hubs. So where are these you know, connector hubs? Uh, if, you if you sort of identify connector hubs through the resting fMRI data, this is just a map of all the areas that the, have the highest participation coefficient. We can assign <coughs> every region in the brain a number. 
And this is, as you see, that this is sort of the map of the highest connectors, medial frontal, lateral frontal, lateral temporal parietal. And this is actually identifying them through the areas that ha are engaging the most cognitive components. So it's identifying it in a different way. You see it's very similar between the two in terms of where these convergence zones are uh, that are areas that engage multiple cognitive components uh, it, versus those that are, have the highest connectivity. Said another way, those areas that are most connected with other brain regions are the same areas that are engaging the most cognitive components during a wide range of tasks. So to summarize what I've said so far, modules in the brain likely perform discrete cognitive functions. Activity at these connector hub nodes increases when there's more cognitive functions or modules engaged, suggesting a role in maintaining the brain's modularity. And the connector hub nodes are located in areas that are most active <coughs> when many cognitive components are engaged. So in this sort of last part, what I want to talk about is really how we kind of relate all of this uh, concepts, these, these ideas about modularity and large-scale organization brain back to behavior, because that's what we're all interested in. Um, and, and that's going to be, and that's sort of the toughest nut to crack. And so to do this, I'm going to introduce another graph theory metric called, called Newman's modularity, or Q, which just quantifies uh, modularity of the entire system. So modularity is just the ratio of the number of edges within a module compared to the number of edges between modules. You get a, what I'm going to call Q. So you get a number close to one would be a very, would be a highly modular network. If I added some connections in, this would be a less, mo this would have a lower Q. This would be a le less modular network. So we can, for every brain or every state, we can calculate this across, with, again, with the resting fMRI data, we can calculate this measurement across the entire brain. And so, the role, what's important, and, and when we think about sort of modularity as a whole, the, each node is going to play an important role, whether it's a provincial hub or connector hub, will directly affect sort of the extent of modularity of the entire system. So let, let me give you an example. Again, here's a brain graph cartoon of provincial hubs in blue and connector hubs in, in, in black. We can think about this as an airport network here, and we know major hubs, <coughs> major connector hubs in this country is San Francisco and, and New York and Chicago. Uh, we, as we're moving our way across a network, for example, if I'm in New York and I'm trying to get back to San Francisco to, to see my son's baseball game, I'm not going to have any problem as long as, uh, as, long as Chicago is doing okay. But if, Chicago, if there's lightning storms in Chicago and Chicago is shut down, even though I'm not going through Chicago, it's going to influence the entire network and I might not get home. I'm going to have to go through Atlanta or something like that, but I'll, I'll get home. Uh, and so. A connector home is going to have a big impact. A connector node is going to have a big impact on the overall modularity of the system. Whereas if something's going on in Milwaukee, I'm not even going to know about it. I'm going to, I'm going to blast through from New York to San Francisco, and you're not going to be completely shut down, and that this system's not going to be affected. So the idea here is that connector hubs will impact large-scale organization in a way that provincial hubs will not. And that's part of the whole concept of, of mod modularity. And so again, we tested this idea that taking out connector loads will decrease modularity of the brain by looking at patients that had damage to connector hubs versus damage to provincial hubs. So we went back to our patients, and again, another study by Katerina and Amy, and again, went back to our patients that had damage to connector hubs, had damage all through the cortex, and now, um, now instead of um, classifying whether they had damage to one particular network or another, we, we classified them according to whether they had damage to connectors or connector hubs or provincial hubs. And these were defined in healthy data. So we took a healthy data set, defined their connectorness and provincial hubness from healthy data by ranking all of the participation coefficients and working memory, working memory, within modular degree values. So here's all the different brain regions we looked at that we parcelated the brain into. Here's all their values. You give a value for every sort of area. Every area is going to either be more a connector-like or provincial hub-like. 
And then we went back to the lesion data and looked to see where their damage was and came up with a score. So each patient will have a score that will characterize how much damage they have to connectors versus how much damage they have to provincial hubs. Make sense? And then we looked to see if that had any effect on their modularity as measured by their resting state fMRI data. <clears throat> and what I'm showing you here is now here on the x-axis here is uh, damage to connectors. So as we move this way, these patients have more damage to connectors. As we move this way, they have more damage to provincial hubs. And on the y-axis is the extent of their, their modularity score. And what you see is as you damage, as patient, patients with more damage to connectors have a bigger, have a, a lower modularity, their modularity is less, whereas damage to provincial hubs don't have any effect on their modularity. This is by calculating modularity just within the hemisphere where they have damage. What was more, even more interesting is if you look at the other hemisphere where they don't have any damage, there's still that relationship. Damage, more damage to connectors even affects modularity of networks in the non-damaged hemisphere. To kind of show, yes. Uh, no, and I'll show you this on the next slide. I kind of have a cartoon of, <clears throat> here's like a cartoon. This is real data, but in a, in a, in a graph format. So we're kind of bird's eye view of what a normal, healthy brain will look like in terms of their brain graph from bold data. Here's a patient, here's two patients with big lesions, same exact size, uh, but in different locations. This one is in a location where it knocks out a provincial hub, and this one's in a location where it knocks out a connector hub. And here you see there's, there's little effect on the overall network compared to here. Here you see is it not only affecting the, the dis disorganizing uh, connectivity within the hemisphere, but even in the hemisphere that's not damaged. So there was no, the, the size of the lesion didn't matter, it was where the lesion is. And, and we've known that from neurology for a long time, that it's, it's, it's where your, your, the lesion is that's the, is not so much the size. Um, of course, if you, have a, you know, if you have the whole hemisphere damage, that's a, a different story. Um, but it also, we, in neurology, we call this diaschesis. It's where a lesion has, a remote effect, has an effect on function remote from the lesion. It's something we don't think about in cognitive science because we like to assign sort of a cognitive process to uh, the area that we've damaged, and we, we don't want to think about that there's all this dysfunction in all these normal areas. But that's, this kind of connectional diaschesis is something we're going to have to grapple with as we, uh, as we, we try to, again, sort of, sort of assign processes to specific brain areas. But for now, the point, only point I'm making is that connectors have a very critical role for maintaining modularity in the brain. And David Warren, Steve Peterson, Dan Trinnell at Iowa, they, they tested their patients. Uh, they found a group of patients in which, uh, in which had damage to connectors and had damage to provincial hubs, just like our patients. But what they had was neuropsychological testing on all these patients. And so here's patients that had damage to these three connector hubs. Again, again, they find it in the same place as we find. It's very consistent across labs. So they found patients that have damage to these connectors versus patients that have damage to these provincial hubs. And then they tested them on a wide variety of neuropsychological tests, attention, language, memory, visual, spatial skills. These are the, the domains here of cognition that they tested. And then they assigned a score of how impaired they were on each of these domains. And if you see red, they're impaired on that cognitive domain. And what you see is, Unlike the patients that have damage to the provincial hubs, those patients that have damage to connector hubs have impairments across a wide range of, 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 of do cognitive domains. It's not specific to any one domain. It's, more, it's, it's a widespread sort of cognitive deficits, which you'd expect from what we had predicted that more modules involve more cognitive uh, components. So again, it's not sort of traditional localization approach that, you know, this is Broca's area and it impairs just, you know, fluency of speech. This is these sort of special connectors will, will impair, if you look for it, will impair, will show deficits across a wide range of uh, sort of to, in a domain general way. And there was another study in which a group looked at MRI scans from over 20,000 patients with 26 different brain disorders. 
And again, they sort of took away the diagnostic boundaries and just looked to see where, if there were patients that had similar pathology. And across nine of these disorders, um, there was similar pathology across these nine neurological and psychiatric disorders. And here, they're showing where the pathology is. So in, anywhere in blue was an area where there was pathology across these nine different neurological and psychiatric disorders. And then they went back in data from healthy subjects and look to see how connected, what kind of nodes these are. And what shows here are these, these were areas that have the highest participation coefficient, the highest degree. These were areas that had the, the what I've been talking about. These were the connector nodes of the brain. These were areas that were most, most connected. So, and, and when you look at these areas, they have higher rates of cerebral blood flow. They have higher aerobic glycolysis, oxidative glucose metabolism. They, they're very biologically costly area, areas that seem to be vulnerable uh, to pathology. So in a way, we can sort of step back from a clinical perspective. We can step back and not be so disease-centric and think about sort of pathology in terms of the connectivity of the brain as opposed to the, the specific sort of di artificial diagnostic labels that we give our patients like Alzheimer's disease and schizophrenia disease. They actually have some common, there's some common principles as to what, what, what leads to pathology uh, in, these, in these clinical conditions. So the picture I've painted so far is that we've got this modular but integrated brain, one that allows for us to be both, both where function can be segregated, vision, motor, but we can also integrate functions. And really the next leap, which I'll end with, is that you know, how do we kind of relate this, these specific, this specific type of organization to specific types of behavior? Do we think about, should we think about a modular brain as being a trait? Eric has some type of, you know, some level of modularity. I have a different level of modularity. That's how we were born. Or we can think about it dynamically as a state that, that will, will change depending on, on the behavior engaged. And of course, the answer is both, right? Th this is evidence of it being trait-like. If you look, if you measure brain modularity, again, with resting fMRI data, uh, this is by Stevens, and you look at working memory capacity, which is a relatively innate ability, uh, there's a strong relationship between modularity and, and capacity. Those with higher uh, brain modularity, just at baseline, have a higher working memory capacity. But we also know if we make these measurements of modularity across tasks, uh, this is just a simple working memory task where it gets more demanding from zero back to one back to two back. As we get to more demanding conditions, the brain becomes less modular. It gets more connected less modular, more integrated. So it's also a dynamic sort of state. Sepeda Sapagani, who was a postdoc in my lab and now faculty at Illinois, did a very interesting study showing that this brain, base, brain modularity metric can predict behavior on a trial by trial basis. So she looked at a very simple task where subjects just had to detect a tone that was slightly above the loud scanner noise. And about 60% of the time, they could, detect, they could detect that tone. And she looked at, she measured brain modularity uh, right before they heard the tone. And then she characterized their brain modularity, whether they detected it, they hit, had a hit, or they had a miss. And here is the, sort of the graph of modularity before a hit, and here's one before a miss. And what you see is, the, the, modular, the, the brain is more modular, uh, closer to sort of the intrinsic state right before they had a hit, as opposed to when they made, made a miss. The brain was in some other state, uh, less modular, modules interacting, whether you're wandering, not paying attention, thinking about finals, whatever, the brain went into a different state, and we could predict uh, whether someone was gonna correctly identify that stimulus or not, based on this, 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 the extent of their modularity before, before the trial. But there's also something, so this suggests this sort of dynamic nature, this sort of dynamic nature to this level of organization. But there's also, we've also got a lot of evidence that there's something about our, st our sort of trait of modularity. Uh, if you, we have been doing a number of different cognitive training 
uh, protocols in which we do cognitive training on individuals with, who have executive function deficits, such as traumatic brain injury. And one of the studies we did with mild traumatic brain injury patients is that they underwent this five-week training in which we were successfully able to improve their executive function after this training period. But before we enrolled them in the program, there was nothing that predicted whether they were going to perform better. Those who were worse at the start didn't get better. Those, there was no neuropsychological test. There was no fMRI measurement that we could make that sort of predicted who was going to get better, who wasn't going to get better. But we had resting data beforehand, and when we measured their modularity, and on the x-axis here is their modularity score, it predicted the extent of their behavioral improvement, which is on the y-axis. So those subjects who started off with a higher baseline modularity were more likely to show gains after chiron training. This was a small group of subjects, but we were lucky enough to get a data set from a very large group of subjects, 160 subjects from Mark Kramer's group in University of Illinois, where young, sub healthy young subjects performed video game training. And this, this many, many hours of video game working memory training actually led to improvements in attention. In, in attention. And in that group, healthy subjects, if their baseline modularity was high to start, they were more likely to improve uh, on, on, this, on this training. And we replicated it again uh, with a group of healthy elderly subjects with a training by a group at UT Dallas where they underwent a, an even different kind of executive function training that improved, again, executive functions. Again, in these older individuals, baseline modularity predicted their improvement. And we finally just got a hold of a group of where, where there was exercise training that improved cognition. And even uh, gains from exercise could be predicted by baseline modularity. So, I'm pretty convinced now, after four replications, that there's something about one state, uh, brain state, at baseline that leads, you, puts you in a in a in a in a, in a kind, of, kind of network state that makes you more uh, adaptable to being to being um, have a positive effect of this training. But the question is, you know, what is the mechanism that leads someone to be more highly modular to respond better to training than someone who's less modular? And a little insight might come from a from a study uh, from Michael Cole that just came out. Michael was actually an undergraduate with Eric at, at Berkeley, and now he's the faculty at Rutgers. And he just published a study just recently, within weeks ago, where he looked at sort of resting, he didn't measure modularity, but he, he sort of looked at resting functional connectivity of, of all regions with every other region, and looked how changes in overall connectivity at rest changed to the task state. And what he found was that if there was little change, meaning that whatever your connectivity was at rest, if it didn't change much when you engage in a task, you, you were more likely to perform, be a higher performer. So he looked at the human connectome data, and for all the tasks, he found that the highest performers were the ones that showed little change between uh, their, re their resting state and their sort of task state. Suggesting that you are perhaps in our higher module patients that you've 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 uh, <coughs> you've sort of developed a network that needs less configuration that it's that sort of less configuration to to a test state that that is best for for optimal performance. The farther you have to sort of take your network sort of to the network that's necessary for tests, the le the less able you're it, the worse you sort of perform. So there's a lot of you know, advantages of a modular brain. If you look at sort of, there's a number, there's lots of computational uh, models of modularity because as I said, modularity is ubiquitous in all systems. So we're not the only, you know, neuroscientists are not the only ones looking at modularity. Uh, even in evolution, uh, even scientists interested in evolution have thought, have thought about uh, modularity and suggest that uh, you know, it's good for evolution because a simple system can evolve to a more complex system by, by kind of adapting one module at a time. There are these computational evolution experiments where they put these select, selection pressures on the, on the system in order to maximize network performance and minimize costs. And when they do that, the networks become more modular. There's, um, other computational modular models of modulate that suggest that modular systems are more efficient. They learn faster, they're quicker to learn sort of more no novel problems. Uh, specific function, what's another advantage is that specific functions can be formed without perturbing the entire system, right? As I start walking, my vision doesn't go black. 
Um, you know, we, we can segregate uh, function. And as a clinician, you know, the advantage is that damage to one module doesn't jeopardize the entire system. I may see a patient that's aphasic and can't speak, but they still have function in many other areas of cognitive ability. It doesn't leave them sort of devastated, doesn't lead to a catastrophic situation. So there are many sort of advantages to a modular system. And so just to conclude, although for some reason it's not letting me go to my last slide, I would say sort of looking back, I guess it was about 20, when I calculated this morning, 23 years ago when I did my first fMRI experiment at Penn um, as a young assistant professor, the, the scanner really hasn't changed that much. The actual pulse sequence is almost exactly the same as it was at that time. The way we're collecting data, surprisingly, is not all that different, but I think what's really different is how clever everyone has gotten sort of how we analyze the fMRI data. And there's certainly a lot more data to analyze. And so I think this has allowed us to sort of shed new light on how the brain is organized. You know, in the past, uh, theories of brain organization really depended on what we could see under the microscope. And now we're kind of, we are transforming patterns of brain activity um, from imaging data into a form that really allow us to test new predictions about how the brain functions. But I want to sort of end, I know there's a lot of students here, and I want to sort of end saying that I get a little uneasy uh, or queasy or whatever the word is when I sort of hear students in neuroscience or psychology, talk, and this happens in my lab, talk about the brain as a graph. Uh, it's not a graph. It's, it's not a mathematical object. It's a real functioning thing. Uh, you have to learn neuroanatomy and neurophysiology first because we're, we have to apply these methods and remain sort of grounded in the anatomy. It has to be sort of grounded in the anatomy and the physiology. It has to make sense. And so, but if you do that, I do really think these kind of levels of analysis are going to pay dividends. I think it's going to really complement other methods that we have in neuroscience at many different levels, from the cellular to the systems. And it really is going to give us this sort of better understanding of, of how, uh, what the large scale organization of the brain is. So I think I'll end there. Thank you for paying attention and take questions. If there are Is there time for questions or? Okay, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Sure, yeah. Yeah, when, with, with DTI data, um, well, there's a lot of issues with sort of partitioning the brain into modules. There's at least sort of 12 or more. There's many different ways of partitioning the brain into modules. So there are, when you do use different algorithms, uh, you, you, the composition of the modules vary a little bit from method to method. But uh, remarkably similar between DTI data and the structural data and the fMRI data in terms of just identifying broadly modules. What seems to be different uh, is, which I didn't talk about today, is sort of these the sort of connector. There's some nodes that I've called connector nodes. There's another classification of nodes called rich club nodes, which are nodes that are more connected with each other than any other, not more connected with other modules, but actually more connected with each other than any other areas of the brain. And those have been called the rich club. And so when you actually look at where connector hubs are and rich club nodes are, it differs between the structural data and the functional data. And, and this is not surprising because functional data can reflect both anatomical and functional connectors. There doesn't have to be a direct connection between two areas to, for them to be highly correlated, whereas in the DTI, there has to be, right? So I think uh, it, people haven't started doing this yet, but I think uh, as we get into so actually wanting to know what these modules actually are, uh, they're, these uh, D, um, DTI and fMRI is going to—they're going to complement each other as opposed to um, tell exactly the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you gave some great demonstrations of uh, the dynamics of this system and how we can try to parse some of the dynamics. But one of the big limitations of fMRI is that we can only take a picture every second or so, uh, or maybe down to you know uh, 0.7 seconds or something like that at this point with. Uh, So my question is, you know, one of the, it seems like the next step to all of this is that we are able to not only depict that there are modules in the brain, but the, that those modules uh, dynamically interact with one, one another um, moment
moment by moment and being able to actually show the moment by moment changes in cognitive state um, as you move from a uh, part of a task where you have to attend to something more to part of a task where you have to reflect on it uh, more internally or something like that. So I just wanted to yeah. hear your opinion on where do you see that going? Yeah, well, well, where I see it going is that it can apply to any data, and it, and, it's, and it is being applied to data. So it has been applied to MEG data, where you can get sort of millisecond, and EEG data, where you can get that millisecond. But of course, with the MEG and EEG, we don't know where in the brain it's coming from, right? It's going to start, as we get more ECOG data, this is uh, uh, elect where a whole uh, half of a hemisphere is, uh, there's an electrode flap has been, fla electrodes have been across the whole hemisphere. We, we'll get sort of millisecond by millisecond uh, data from ECOG data. There's some troubles with ECOG in terms of how long you record from and noisiness, but that's sort of another set. And certainly we can get it from monkey physiology data if, if monkey physiologists start putting across the whole grid. And so I think, uh, and, and you know, this, these metrics can apply to all these data, and we're going to have to, and, you know, it's starting to be done uh, in, in rats and mice as well, you know. And so, yeah, I think that's where it's going. We're going to, that's why I sort of at the end said it's going to form all levels of analysis. We're going to only have it at the second, you know, the seconds level of analysis, and, and hopefully the millisecond level analysis is going to come from our colleagues who can apply this at the, at the, we have to first convince our colleagues that looking at the whole brain is important. I, I just think, you know, I think maybe this is where the strength of fMRI comes in. We, we, this is what we have is whole brain data, and this is the one thing we can actually, we, we can actually do with, with fMRI. So, yeah. So I'm curious whether you think the brain has to be modular, or whether it benefits from being modular, or whether it might just be modular because of the evolutionary constraints or even yeah, I mean, I think that's what, uh, you know, why we became modular, uh, yeah, right. We certainly could have become modular, not because it's better, but just that's the way, the way it worked out. And, and you can definitely, I've heard, as I've given this talk a couple of times, I've definitely heard from folks saying, well, I can build a model that sort of is not modular, that can be fast and efficient and do all these all things. And that's true. You can build systems that, that act like modular. But, but, we know that Wernicke's area is connected to Broca's area by an arc of fasciculus, and that's just how it's built. It, it's, it's, it's not connected to every other part of the brain. So, so it's a lot, well, we know anatomically that the brain is, is modular. Um, we, so we are constrained by sort of the anatomy and uh, by, the ana by the anatomy. So I, the anatomy sort of dictates it. So I think at some level, we, we, it's sort of a question that was answered before I even start. But on, on that level, why it's, bet why it's um, why it just turned out to be better, that's sort of the interesting sort of question if whether it sort of was, you know, evolved that way because it is better. But the, these kind of computational evolution experiments that I've been looking at are really very interesting because they, they, like I said, when they sort of force these selection pressures on the model and they force it to not be sort of biologically costly and have, you know, be efficient as connections, it just sort of evolves into a sort of a modular system. And the one point I should make is that, um, Modularity is only better in big systems. So, at least at the computational level, if you have a small system, uh, they don't, it, you know, C. elegans does not do better by breaking it up into modules. So it's sort of a, this is meant to be for, you know, for big, big systems like, like the brain. Um, yeah. So I'm wondering about connectivity across the whole lifespan. So for example, we touched on aging a little bit. Yeah. Um, so for example, in healthy cognitive aging, Yeah, so what happens, uh, there's been a number of aging studies. Across the board, everyone finds modularity goes down with, with, with healthy aging. But that, that's, you know, but, the, but, but what we've shown and, and uh, just recently is that what go, it goes down, but sort of connectors, um, but there seems to be uh, areas, more connectors sort of, got, areas become more connector-like, areas that were sort of less connected, especially more anteriors that weren't as connected with that back of the brain have become sort of more connected. So there's this change in connectivity. This is functional connectivity, obviously, because we're not growing new pathways. And, and that sort of made me think about on the last question is that another, Danny Bassett had sort of shown that um, it wasn't, she looked at how people perform, how well people performed over a, a, a motor task. And those who were the best actually were the ones where nodes were most flexible, that as the task changed, 
change, they change their, they're most flexible in changing their connectivity as they learn the task. So it's this sort of dynamic, it's, it's that, that kind of, you know, that level of dynamics we can get at, you know, how a, a node changes over the course of a task. But we, and that's important too, in addition to knowing millisecond by millisecond how sort of an area changes over the, learning something over the course of a day can be measured with, with this method. And so it was the flexibility, she had a measurement for flexibility of nodes and that predicted ultimately learning a, a skill task. <coughs> yeah, Danny Bassett has a ton of great stuff on, on this, yeah. So, so what type of experiments will get at sort of the, dy the dynamics of the modularity is, is what you're asking or? Not so much the dynamics <coughs> as much as the mechanisms that are underlying that change of modularity and or the kind of intermediate forces that would be causing that thing to happen. So is this like a executive function of thought of something that might be modulating modularity all the way in time, right? Or is this yeah. Oh, well, there's a whole bunch of things. I mean, though, first of all, the, the sort of ha when you look at a glo the global modularity changes, like say going from the end back, you know, going more demands, um, changes in just particular modules can lead to that overall change in modularity. So it can just be between a sort of, you know, an executive function module and a visual spatial module. If all it, a lot of changes between those two modules can drive the overall modularity. So whole brain modularity, that, that sort of change in modularity will depend on what modules are engaged by a particular task. So for, you know, what we've shown is, is like for a more cognitive task, the brain gets overall less modular, presumably need more integrated, but on a sort of more motor skill type task, it actually gets more modular. You know, so it depends on what the state, you know, more or less modular will depend on what the task is at hand. But in terms of the dynamics, there's really no information. I mean, we've got neuromodulatory systems that are dry, you know, dopamine, acetylcholine, serotonin that, that are likely driving, you know, are in a position to drive sort of overall modularity. And sort of the very specific, and we also got information that's being carried at different frequencies, you know, beta, beta versus gamma, which, are, which presumably draw, draw, can drive sort of this large scale uh, connectivity. And we don't have any of this, you know, we don't have any of this information. So I think when we start moving, when we start doing these kind of things with data that can, can actually measure sort of oscillations, can actually measure things like transmitters, then we'll get at it. Bolt, the bolt, bolt's not gonna get at the kind of things you're asking, I think. So I think we're uh, getting hungry. Uh, so, uh, I want to thank Mark for coming.